hi. <laughs> um, should we just maybe, well, I'm calling the meeting to order. Oh, maybe we should review Zoom procedures first. Do we need to do that? And then make No, we'll okay. be fine. Could okay. be the only people on our um, planning, commissioner. planning commissioners. Okay. Um, well, maybe then should we uh, just introduce ourselves for Tim and just go around? I'm Ariane Sam. I was, I am now the chair because nobody else wanted to do it. But if you ever have aspirations for chair, just saying it's, you know. <laughs> Jump straight in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can jump straight in anytime. Um, I work at the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, and I guess I've been on the planning commission the longest of anyone, but I can't remember what year I started. Um, you and Aaron. Yeah, 2019. It has to be you two because you're the only two ones who have nameplates. Oh, okay. Oh, my gosh. There I we, came, we came in in 2018. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. Wow. That's that's how long it's been. Maybe even yeah, maybe even seventeen, but I think eighteen for sure. Yeah, Aaron, do you want to go next and just introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Hi, Tim. I'm I'm Aaron Kasicki. As you, Tim and I are actually neighbors, we live right down the street from. Oh, Aaron. okay. Um. So, hi, Tim. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, oh, I'm Maria Arsenlis. We also know each other. Okay. I'm technically vice chair of the commission. So I'm Mike Miller. I'm the planning director of the city. Been here for, as I said, 10 and a half years. Oh. Um, I'm Leah Candland, and I was the newest person on the list <laughs> until Tim. So nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Uh, yeah, and I'm Tim Sinnott, and uh, happy to be here. Happy to join in in all of the work that needs to get done. I've been in Montpelier for a dozen years. Um, I work remotely for an organization that does mapping. So that's one of the things I'm excited about helping and bringing to the commission, um, but also just a, a love of the city and wanting to help out. Okay, great. So and we you. have one more commissioner, is Sean. Hi, Tim. I'm Sean. Uh, I've only been on here since uh, May, but uh, we've had a lot of turnover since then. So uh, I guess you get seniority pretty fast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Gabe Lajeunesse is the one commissioner who's missing tonight. He didn't tell me he wasn't going to make it, but okay, didn't make it. Yeah, holiday week. Okay. Um, so we have an agenda in front of us. Would anyone like to move approval of the agenda? I'll move approval. I'll second. Motion okay. by Sean, second by Maria. I <laughs> know the audio is a little different tonight. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Can I can I make a quick question really really quickly? Uh -huh. Before we before we do that, sorry, it's a little late. Um, I'm sure most of you, if not all of us, have received some additional information from um, Steve. Uh, Steve. <laughs> um, is there any want or need, do you think, to put that on the agenda and have further discussion, or is that something we can table to a later meeting? Um, I guess, yeah, I hadn't really. Steve is here, so the, might, some of that might be brought up tonight in the yeah, conversation. I, I didn't get yeah. copies of it, so it's something you guys would have to go and let me know. Okay, that's helpful. I related to something I in here. was there, so that's why I just, I didn't know if we needed to. But if he's there, I'm sure we'll probably hear something from him. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that's usually I'm ill prepared. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that, but that's a good question. But as Mike said, Steve is here. So maybe during general business, we can cover that. Um, so comments from the chair. Um, just going to say we have. I think we all received the email from Steve, but since he's here, let's talk about it in general business. Um, and I did also receive an email from Peter Kelman about just sharing that about, um, you know, there was an article in Vermont Digger about what Rutland is doing for housing recently. So I will forward that around. But um, at some point, if we ever get around to it, I think it would be interesting to hear more about what Rutland's done with their um planning and zoning, because I think they did focus on really stripping down some regulatory barriers. So mm -hmm. that's just a point. Um, 
And did you I all read get that article? You did and read the I article. Was I, and I was going to bring it up too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when did it? When did it happen or go into effect? Is it a recent change? I'm not sure the article said about the planning and zoning changes. Do you know, Mike? It sounded like they were going through the process. So I, oh, okay. I don't know if they're... My guess is if we were to look at the zoning, they're probably trying... They're, they're probably not farther ahead than, than we are. Okay. I was like, how did it turn out? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of these articles that get written. They're like, oh, they passed their zoning. They're going to do all this stuff. And it's like, well, you know, we passed our zoning six years ago. And, yeah. you know, we're still waiting for the for the convoy of builders to show up. Yeah. Um, but there, it looked like they had two points. One was the regulatory changes, which we've already done. And the second piece was that they were looking at trying to come up with a system for offering low interest loans to builders to try to help to defray the cost because obviously if you're taking out loans at eight or nine percent that's money that increased the cost of the housing down the road so if they were able to get money to the builders that might be able to keep the costs down um i we've talked about this in the office as an idea but we it looks like they may have some source of funding. Um, certain places have easier times getting certain funding, Barry City, Rutland, St. John's Barry, mm -hmm. um, just because they have uh, a lower income census. Yeah. Tracks or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Their, their census tracks qualify them for certain things that we don't qualify for. So I'm not entirely sure where they're getting the funding, but even with the funding, we're not sure. I, I, wish them the best and I hope hope it does work out but I'm not sure their housing costs are so low that I couldn't um, I can't imagine it costs less to build in Rutland than it would be in you know Rutland town you know it's just it doesn't seem like the costs would be less they would be the same and that the housing units are 180 to 230,000 I think that article said I just can't imagine you're building much in that price range. Um, you're going to probably try to be doing a lot of renovations and trying to work in, in that framework. Um, so it's, it's interesting. We're always looking for ideas. Um, but the idea of trying to defray the cost of capital getting money is something we've talked about, but we just don't know where we would get a large enough sum of money that it would make a substantial difference in the cost you know, or, or in the production, you know, we get a certain number, 20 units a year that come online. Um, but how much money would it take to get that up to a much higher number? Yeah. And I also feel like a lot of those applications to the, to that housing pool may not actually turn into developments. I mean, they're plans right now, not to be, I'm very <laughs> working in housing. I'm very, uh, Blew me about <laughs> well it just exactly what mike said it costs way more than what you could recoup as yeah. a private developer i think and maybe except for chittenden county mm -hmm. um it's just really tough in the rest of the state i think um Speaking but i would be interested to hear where they are in, in terms yeah. of their planning it would, be, would be interesting to see yeah. how things turn out um yeah. down the road again these are the same types of, you know, ideas. If they were to look at the city of Montpelier, like, well, look at what the city of Montpelier is doing. They bought Country Club Road. It's like, well, that's buying it as one piece, actually getting it developed as another. Coming up with an idea to subsidize housing construction in your community is one thing. Actually following through and getting that program in place and having it work is going to be the next step to see how well they do. But I, I hope they do great. Um, <laughs> Uh, it is an idea, as I said, that we had thought about, and if they can make it work, that's great. Well, I wanted to ask about the the RFP for that lot next to the drawing board. Yes. Has anything happened with that yet? No, no. we've had oh, no okay. no responses yet. No response. Oh, okay. Yeah. Is there a time period for the RFP? I, uh, Josh is the one working on it. I want to say it's sometime in December. Oh, okay. So there might still be time. There might still be time. But you haven't heard anything. I haven't heard anything. We've, we've had nobody, no, nobody, no biting on it. Yeah. 
All right. Um, and then I was just going to mention one more thing and then pass it to Maria. Did you guys get, I don't know if it's of interest, but there was, I got something from the CVRPC about a land use planning um, oh, or a land use uh, yeah. informative uh, session on December 19th. Did you guys get that or should I forward that? Okay, I'll yeah, forward that. That'd be great. Round. It's on a Thursday evening, December 19th. <laughs> it's 6 p.m., so it could be a tough time, but... <laughs> Sounds like a good good session. And one of the things they mentioned was going over the designations, mm -hmm. which is of interest because we've been hearing about it for Country Club Road. So yeah, is it only open to commissioners? Like who can go? No, it's open. It's open. Yeah, I, I think all the planning commissioners certainly could go. Oh, there's Gabe. Hi, Gabe. Yes. Oh. <laughs> uh, Gabe. Hi. No, I wasn't sure if people were already on that list, so I will forward that around. Um, and then Maria, you wanted to update us on. Oh yeah, I just want to update everyone on what's been going on with the bike path. Um, so Ariane and I met with the homelessness task force. I my husband is on the complete streets committee, so that's an easy meeting that we can have. <laughs> um, I also met with uh, Rebecca Copans Copans, and she's the chair of the housing commission. And we are both meeting with the police chief next week just to see like what his read on the entire situation is and what we can do to even prevent these situations from arising in the first place. Um, and then uh, MRPS invited me to come to the high school and sit in the, or in the library and talk to kids and see what their experiences have been because it's really hard. It's been really hard to get that kind of contact because kids aren't telling their parents and they aren't telling adults. Um, and I've just been asking them directly because I work with a lot of kids. Um, so I'm curious to see what they say. And I've heard that it's gotten better. I don't know if like anyone has, you know, so, but the kids have been reporting that like, it hasn't been like 30 people hanging out on the bike path that, which is what those before. So I'm curious to see what they think about that too. If they're like actually using the bike path to get to school again, or if it's still off limits. Um, Is there seasonality to the bike path use? I know, I'm curious about so, that. Yeah. Yeah, if it is. I think the Homelessness Task Force talked about that, how there is like a winter shelter that opens, right? Oh, yeah. The, there is a seasonality to yeah. the shelters. But I don't know. I mean, it, it's not, a, well, I don't know if it's open during the day. Yeah, um, but yeah, that's also something to ask about too, I think. Um, so again, I'm just trying to do research so that we come, that we're well informed about what's happening. And then what Rebecca and I kind of thought up is like if all of the commissions, city commissions can come up with their own way of solving it, you know, of like addressing this issue, the safety issue, um, and like give, concrete proposals to city council of what can be done about it. Like long-term, not, you know, not just like a police sweep, like an actual like long-term solution to how isolated it is there, how unused it currently is. Um, that if we can all give city council some concrete steps that we might see improvement in the future. Um, you know, as even Rebecca said, like, or, an apartment building right there, you know, <laughs> like there's plenty of ways to make it a more usable space, um, more highly trafficked space, I guess. So, um, so I guess I'm curious what your meeting with the police chief is going to, because I thought we were sort of approaching it from a design perspective. So I'm yeah. not sure, like, well, I know. So Rebecca brought that up and she was curious, like what, they have heard like what they perceive their role to be here because I think currently they're the only it's like the only department in the city that's like actively there which I don't think should be the case but I think that is what's happening um just to get his read on it um I don't know I, I don't really know what we're going to hear or get out of it but I think it's I'm curious to see like what I mean, I'm sure, like, I have a feeling that we might go in there and the police department may say, like, yeah, we don't actually want to be doing this, <laughs> you know, like, which, 
like or like we don't think this should be our role like i think there's a lot of things that they could say that wouldn't be entirely unsurprising um but i don't know He's already said that he hasn't really heard these things from kids, which isn't surprising either, because kids aren't telling their parents or teachers. It's definitely not getting to the police department, you know. Um, so I don't know. You can come with us if you'd like. Yeah, I might be. When is it? I might be interested in coming. It's next week, December. I think December 5th. But, I can send you. Okay. It's more just like it's information gathering yeah. um, from all, all the different groups that have like intersected there. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, obviously you're doing a lot of this just as a, as a parent and an interested citizen, but, um, I don't, yeah, I guess I don't, I'm not sure, I have to think about it a little bit more, but mm. the planning commission and with the police department, I don't know how I feel about that or oh. what I think about that. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's for the precautioning on there because it wasn't the homelessness task force you met with it was the chair and vice chair not even a designated subcommittee of the homelessness task force so i i was listening to their meeting where mm. they described the same meeting but we'll have to be at one of the microphones for the public no, to hear you was, is there public oh yes you have um well i wanted to reserve my time to talk about other stuff but this is an area that i've been involved in uh the, the reason that there's no activity over there now is because the police strong armed everybody under threat of arrest, which is a violation of civil liberties for the people who weren't making any trouble. And everybody's complacently allowing that to happen in our, you know, righteous town. So I'm not complacent about that because there are people that are peaceable that hang out there because they got nowhere else up to go. And the folks that are in the shelter are not folks that aren't in the shelter for either personal reasons or have lost the privilege of the shelter are still outside. And so that's a complex situation that we've created by neglecting our responsibilities to have the homelessness task force accomplish anything in five years. So yes, there's a stronger role for the planning commission to find shelter, but most of these responses, the police will tell you we've had a thousand calls, a more important question would be how many of them do you respond to with a cruiser role and how many of them might have been better handled by a mental health professional or just a, a community yeah. service, you know, de-escalator, right? So right. that is one of my questions because I've heard that there is a social worker that works for the city, but they work under the police department. Yeah, they're embedded and they're shared with Barry. Kind of like so it's a very like, limited and it takes know. a long time to get like there. stuff like that that I want to get information about. Like, does the city have a social worker? <laughs> <laughs> and why would they report to the police department? You know, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess because we don't really have a public, I mean, just, yeah. just my, that is like, so we don't have any other <laughs> venue for public safety. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we're trying to incorporate more social work and mental health first aid in the police, but okay. I just wanted to, yeah, you know, um, say that about the meeting, but it sounds, it sounds interesting and I'm sure. I just want to know how things work. So okay. That's why <laughs> <laughs> I'm just nosy. I want to know how it works and like what they have what their direction has been from city council. Oh, okay. I feel like we've been, or I've at least been very consistent saying, I don't think this is a law enforcement issue. Um, but if that's the only lever that they think they have to pull, then that's the lever they're going to pull, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see like how it's functioning from that side. Another relevant piece is that the city recently, I believe it targeted at me, put a paywall between us and the public records of the reports. You should read the incident reports that the police have collected. Uh, and now they're $10 a piece or $45 for a body cam video. And they always run the body cam video. So I've encouraged the folks who have been illegally displaced from the bike path to get the body cam video of them being displaced and based, you know? Somebody needs to stand up for the rights of the least powerful and most vulnerable. And if y'all are going to get involved at all, I'd ask you to keep that perspective in mind. I mean, to me, though, the least powerful in the situation are like the 11-year-olds that are getting, I mean, I have 
it's not a matter of children feeling scared walking past there. It's like the matter of children actually being threatened and chased and followed. And yes, you know, so like to me, an 11 year old is a much more vulnerable yes. person and I'd like than an read, adult. You I know, think reading the incident report of that and figuring, I don't need the name. These, this is what I'm saying. It's not in the incident reports. These kids are not telling adults what's happening. So that's why I have to go into the schools. And that's why I'm talking to children sure. individually. Like they aren't even telling their parents what has happened. Well, then it's hearsay. It's like, is it really even happening? Well, no one's going to jail over it. No, but I'm just saying that. I mean, I hearsay we, is illegal. We, we, we whipped it into a lot of hearsay without any evidence. And the evidence is what children are telling us. I thought they weren't telling you. They are telling me. Okay. All right. They aren't telling their parents. They definitely are not telling the police department. Okay, I I all for protecting the children, and and teaching them to a proper appropriate response if someone says something rude to them, right? Which is what? Oh, I don't know. I mean, well, you, what? I mean, I don't think there is an appropriate response because I don't think that should be said to them in the first place. Well, I'm just saying that we've created this situation by leaving people outside until they've gotten so desperate yeah. and disinhibited that they're abusing each other and potentially saying rude things to kids yeah, over. I think we all agree. It's all not right. okay, right. but I'm saying let's look at the root cause. Right, and that's what I'm hoping all the commissions can kind of work together on. It's like a bigger, long view solution to this. Um, so. Okay. All right. Sorry. Well, let's... <laughs> Thank you. I, I, have quick, I just have a, I have, a, I have a quick question really quickly, and I appreciate all the information gathering efforts that you're doing, Maria. I think it's, I mean, I think it's a real issue that deserves to be delved into as much as possible. But to the extent that you're having meetings A at the school and B with the police department, I just want to be clear: Are you doing that under the aegis of the as like a representative of the planning commission? No, I mean, I introduce myself as. You know, a mother in Armour PS as a small town, a, like a downtown business owner, also a vice chair of the planning commission. I've been gathering data to bring to the planning commission. Um, so, Aaron's thinking about it. I think. Yeah, that, no, I, I just, yeah. I mean, I, I voiced this in an email earlier, and I just think it bears repeating, and I'm going to keep repeating this. Is I have real serious reservations about our authority under Title Twenty Four to what our options are to impact this situation. I don't think it's a transportation issue. It's clearly a public health and safety issue. Um, I just think we need to be, before we start engaging with other commissions and whatnot, we need to have a very serious discussion amongst this group and figure out what we are comfortable doing and not doing. Um, because again, I. Again, I agree this is an issue that is going to take a, you know, a multi-pronged approach from various agencies, commissions, and various other components of the city apparatus. I just don't see how we have the authority to do much about this, and I'm willing to have that debate, but I would rather have that discussion prior to anyone making representations about what we might do in the future in conjunction with anybody else. So, um, and that's, I'm not trying to dissuade you from having these meetings at all. I, I'm just saying like, I think that there is a threshold issue as to what we can and can't do under the law um, that I think we need to have a, a pretty thorough discussion about to figure out what options we have, so. Okay, I mean, should we put that on a future agenda or? Does anybody else have thoughts about it? Yeah, I can so put it on a future agenda because I don't. Um, I think we were planning on putting on a future agenda, but then yeah. all of these public meetings yeah. started taking place. Um, and I, I think it's relevant to this whole country club road issue, too. I don't know if you agree, Aaron, but like what our mm -hmm. what our role would be or what our. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I just, I think it is, um, you know, and, and Mike did this, I think it was probably back in last, it was not that long ago. I feel like it was probably in the summer. He, we did have a discussion about sort of kind of, I guess I would call it the enabling statute under Title 24, was it 
I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but you know, it gives us the like what our scope of authority and jurisdiction is both under the uh, city charter and under Title Twenty Four. Like, I think it's just I think it's just helpful, especially so now that we have some new folks on board, to just ha have kind of a baseline discussion about wh what the real core functions of the commission are. And I and I I am happy to sort of test the boundaries of what we can and can't do, but I just think we need to all have that discussion and be in agreement about that stuff before. I just don't want to get too far out in front of your efforts, Maria, only to kind of come to the conclusion yeah. that 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 we're we can't really do the things that we may have thought that we did. And I certainly don't want to be in a position where um, anybody here has sort of made representation to anybody else about what we could and couldn't do. Um, and then only to realize we can't do it. So I, I, I just, I, that's just is a long way of saying like, yeah, I would be in support of putting something on the agenda and then like, you know, the next meeting or two and really have really drill down on this subject and sort of get a better sense of where, what we think we can and can't do both with respect to the bike path issue and probably to the country club road issue that you're talking about. So. Okay. Um, so I guess Mike, we could, uh, Maybe before, I don't know. Well, let's talk about at the end of the meeting, like when, I, I don't know what our schedule is in terms of like <laughs> trying yeah. to get some of these public sessions. So maybe, um, yeah, I don't know when would be the best time to have that discussion. And Mike, would you feel, do you feel comfortable advising us on that and sending us the statute? I mean, I know Aaron's a lawyer, so he's like, I don't know. I do too. Yes, and Maria. I'm sorry. <laughs> he is. You are. He's practicing. He's practicing. Okay. <laughs> or your approach. I would. I guess I meant to say Aaron is approaching it. I think from a legal, or maybe you are. You are too. We have. I think we have different. It's fine. This is why yeah. we bring it to the commission. Yeah. Yeah. No. I like. I said. I. have don't doubt that we have disagreements about this, but I think that needs it just warrants a larger discussion so that we can make a unified decision, like as a commission about what we're going to do, as opposed to have some people doing some things and other people saying, I don't want to do that. So. I mean, Mike, do you, to my question, do you feel comfortable leading us in that discussion or? Yeah, because I mean, I think for the most part, everything that's going on now is perfectly fine. Um, you know, Maria just doing information gathering to bring back and at some point we can put it on an agenda to have a conversation of okay you know what's what's the path going forward what are we going to do now that we have the information what's you know what do we you know here's here's what we know is there something within our sphere of influence that we should be working on or are we just going to support other agencies or other other things and there can be the conversation of what we have the ability to influence. And I, I think I think broadly, planning commissions can have, you know, planning commissions in other communities could recommend, you know, it's not related to this, but noise ordinances and other things that go, the council should do this or the select board should do that. Um, it's not necessarily something the planning commission would end up enforcing so what would we do here uh, you know i think we could advise council on things but um you know we don't have direct ability to impact it we would have to be working through somebody else to go through and say planning commission supports these these avenues of of solving it and it could be something i put into the city plan it could be something i put into a different different document i mean i can't see there's going to be a zoning solution i can't see that there's going to be you know we it's i i i think there's going to be challenges to see where we would have direct authority to make changes but planning commissions i think broadly have a lot of power to try to go through and, and talk about things So. Uh, I'm just curious, Aaron, while we're talking about this, what do you, do you feel like making recommendations to city council is in your read of the statute under the purview? I don't have it in front of me and it's been a little bit of time since I have, so take this with a huge grain of salt, but I mean, my, my initial read of it was, 
my primary concern is this is I, I we surely have my read of it as the best I recollect we have the authority to make recommendations to the city council about transportation issues but I don't think that that spills over into sort of concerns about public health like public safety which I think that this sort of really bleeds more into that and I'm you know and it's what it boils down to this is I think that we clearly have the authority to make recommendations about you know what infrastructure should be cited you know for transportation like a, like we could certainly say we think a bike path is appropriate to be here and here's you know we can make the necessary sort of design changes to accommodate that would make those recommendations to the city council i worry that what we're moving into is is making recommendations about who can use it <laughs> like and under what sort of circumstances those things can be used and i think that's just it gets this very sticky very quickly and you know, I, again, I appreciate that this is going to be a multi, an interdisciplinary and multi-pronged effort from a lot of the, you know, resource, town resources to address these issues going forward, you know, going forward. Um, but I just really am hesitant to sort of make recommendations about what we think we can do in a public safety sphere. And I, I do think that that's sort of outside of our authority. I, I just don't see that in my read of the statute. And I just, I just, and I'm not saying that there's not room for it. I just want to make sure that we're all clear about what the contours of that is before. Um, yeah, because I, I think the other piece too is, is like, I'm sure Maria, you want to do this partially because you have concerns, like personal concerns, which I think are very valid, but like, I don't want you to take a laboring oar and doing all this work under the assumption that we would make certain recommendations. I'd rather have the discussion now so that we all have sort of a paradigm under which to do this additional work, um, you know, and have scoped it out rather than do it the other way around. So, Aaron, were you at the meeting that we talked about this? I feel like you may have been traveling. That this is the one where we didn't have a forum. forum that week. Yeah, that was the one. I was there for part of it, but I don't think for that part um, of it. I, mean, I think the recommendations that we were thinking of was like mowing down the weeds. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like it was a very kind of surface level discussion of like what can be done to just like improve that atmosphere. Sure. Um, and that's and that's fair. And that's and if that's the case, great. But I again, A, we didn't have a quorum at that meeting. So we didn't right. have many people there in the first place. We have new people that are just come on board. So I think this is a good opportunity to sort of revisit what the you know the core roles of the planning commission are in the context of a real sort of live issue, so to speak. Um and we can we can have those discussions. I just um I just think it would be helpful right now. Because it is to me, it's just this could be fraught with some issues that I think we can get out in front of if we just have this discussion amongst ourselves. And I'm I'm not saying you or anybody else is wrong in having a different read with any of this stuff. I am by nature just cautious about these things when I, you know, look at Title Twenty Four. So yeah, no, I mean, I think it makes sense for, I mean, all of us to also come up with, like. Like Mike was saying, like what now that we know this, what can we do? You know, like what is in our authority to do about this? Um, and that could be nothing, you know. Um, I mean, I still I would still pursue it personally because I do, you know, like I talk to these kids and it's terrifying and I want to make it better for them, you know. Um even if the planning commission doesn't think that they have anything to do with it. So sure. I think sure. And I, and like I said, I just think that discussion, having that discussion sooner rather than later, it helps us figure out what we, you know, the planning commission feels comfortable attaching, you know, the planning commission <laughs> kind of yeah. title to to recommendations versus what you want to do on your own. And that I, I just think it's I think it's just helpful. And it would just sort of create some clarity for everybody as we sort of continue to talk about this, which I'm sure is going to be a thread that binds what we do for a while now. It's gonna be, you know, this is gonna be just kind of an issue that lurks in the background, I think, for a while. Yeah, well, it seems like, like you said, you're pursuing it anyway, so we're, you're not, or you feel like you would like to pursue it anyway, so. 
I mean, I, I would. <laughs> would yeah. I don't want to <laughs> don't, be. Yeah, right. No, but, you don't want to. Be. But I've heard enough kids say stuff to me about it. I feel compelled to because, I mean, it's, I worry about them. So, um, I mean, my, my hope is that eventually I would be able to present all of my findings to the planning commission and that we can have a meeting where we discuss what can we do about this, if anything, you know, and that we would all come to an agreement um, on what we can do. And if that's nothing, then that's, you know, then that is the, the resolution. But if there is something that we could do and sign like a letter jointly to city council, that would also be great. Like, I just, I wanted to be able to provide you all with like as much information as I can on what I think the issue is and what solutions I think are out there so that everyone can decide what to do. No, that's helpful. And I would, I was just going to say the, you know, the thing is that because you're giving sort of an update about those efforts in the planning commission, you know, as part of the planning commission meeting, it may be just sort of just, I sort of perked up because I'm like, I want to make sure that to, is this part of, plan, of a planning commission effort? Is it part of an effort that you're doing on your own? And so it, this has been helpful to have this discussion here, okay. um, you know, but I still think that whether that's sooner or later, preferably sooner, we should sit down and sort of take a look at Title 24 and the city and the town charter and kind of just make sure that we feel comfortable conceptually about what we can and can't do as we might think about specific options going forward. Yeah, I mean, to me, it seems like um, now that we've been talking, um, it seems like to me, if Maria presents us with the information and some recommendations, to me, that's easier to make a decision about can we do this? Because it's a little more concrete rather right. than abstract. Um, so I would support just that process. Right. And I also, I didn't want it to be a situation where like, like Maria's doing what? Because that's, I just want to let you guys know on <laughs> what meetings I had planned. So you weren't caught off guard in any way, you know, that. Like she's doing what at the high school, you know? Um, so yeah. that's, that was my goal, just to apprise all of you of my continuing research. Yeah, and that, that was kind of my reaction when I just heard that, so. Right, and I got ahead of it. I got ahead of it, Erin. I saw it coming. I had the same reaction about the police, though. I know you did. <laughs> so good. I'm glad that we had this discussion. I think it's, yeah. Um, but I don't know. That seems like. If a planning commissioner wants to, yeah, investigate an issue and then come back and present to the board about something, that does seem, now that we've talked through it, I think it seems appropriate. But you're not doing it on behalf of the planning commission. That's probably no. where it, it creates. Right. Your seat on the planning commission is useful to inform your colleagues, but it's it might be misleading if you are interpreted even erroneously as representing the planning commission in these meetings. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I do because I know that. I mean, that's a fine line, but I, I don't didn't mean to suggest it. you do. I just yeah. that's the caution. And I looked through the statute and there isn't anything about public safety or health that anchors in your powers and duties. So uh, I'm happy to provide. I've got copies of a different section, but this one you're looking to the powers and duties of planning commissions is 4325. I mean, even if it's not explicitly in the statute, we are producing, helping produce a city plan that is talking about public safety. Correct. And, and well, I, we are involved I'm, in planning. Yeah, and help. I mean, I, I and urban design. Yeah, is part of all that. So anyway, but especially areas that are safe or risky uh, in town, and how to address those vulnerabilities. Okay. All right. So. I think we should move on to general business unless anyone else has anything else. Oh, well, that was sure anyway. Okay. I want to be general business. Okay. All right. So I I pulled have, how many of y'all have been presented a copy of the planning manual? Any anybody read it? Besides Mike? No, oh, this is from um, you, to the mic? Yes. Oh. This is from ACCD. Yeah, the planning manual is put out by ACCD in two volumes, 
module one and module two. It's too much for me to print. I asked him if they had any printed copies and they got back to me today and said they don't. So I think it would be a good investment because it lays out uh, methodically and in detail the kind of considerations you're wrestling with and who, in effect, I think what I said at the first meeting I came to about this new web storyboard process being ineffective, it, it's that's evidenced by the lack of participation in these meetings. This is supposed to be a public input meeting on some modules of it, and nobody's here but me. And the, I got a couple other sections of it, brief sections that, and uh, I'm have I printed out, and they're useful because I don't think Mike should be driving the bus here. I think the commission needs to be driving the bus. And y'all need to be giving direction to Mike of what you want in the plan, and and whether or not the public participation is effective enough, and what else needs to be done. And but I'm really wanting to focus because, in the interest of time, I'm wanting to focus on the Country Club Road module because you're still. The last piece that's left to be written and presented is the land use plan, and that's where we keep hearing Country Club Road is going to be included. But just before the meeting convened tonight, we had a, I had a discussion here with Mike, and it's if I interpret it, if I understood correctly, the city's stance right now is that they put in an application for an expanded growth center, and it was revoked. And now they're going to rest on that application and any little ads that might come in versus go back to the statute and read the statute and see what needs to be in there. And it all needs to be in there. That's the, the handout. The non-italicized stuff in the thing I sent you speaks to what needs to be included in there. And it has to, a growth center has to combine uh, commerce and retail and, and industry and <clears throat> You don't get it just as a place to build housing and and play frisbee. You you you. Time is of. Time is of the essence to get a growth center and a TIF district, or the taxpayers are going to force you to for, force us to sell that property. Okay, a lot of people aren't happy that we bought it in the first place. Many people are doubting whether the city has the capacity to develop it or even to look, entice a developer to come. And that's where the, the vision of what would it look like if it included all the things that a growth center and a TIF require, job creation, working opportunities there, housing, uh, civic buildings. And what I'm hearing from the city is they're not going to proceed to develop a master plan for that property. They're going to see what they can get away with and try to build, what is it, high high priority housing, 40 units of high priority housing. And I think that would be a huge mistake. And there's also an under consideration selling the building that's right at the core of it in some of the most level developable land to a pickleball, tennis club, virtual sports. And that would be a huge mistake before we've done our due diligence and figured out what is it going to take to meet the requirements of a growth center and potentially a new town center. <clears throat> I think I've made the argument that because of its location and it's not contiguous, a new town center is probably our best bet and we will need a legislation to enable that for a town that already has a town center. And so there's language drafted that is being reviewed towards that end. Um, but it would take, and it's in the summary at the back, at the last page of what I sent you, that it would take this planning commission getting their head around it and saying, yes, we want to develop a master plan for that. And what are we going to need in budget? What are we going to need? Who are we going to need to hire? When do we get started? What have we done or not done with the next steps as recommended by the consultant we hired last year, years ago? The next steps chapter. Um, and why haven't we done those things? You know, it's, I've watched under this administration over 30 years, almost every project gets screwed up, you know, from the car lot, from the transit center, from the French's block, from the district heat system. So 
here's a time where this country club property is too important to let it get screwed up, you know? So y'all are going to have to take the reins here and decide whether you want to insist on a master plan as, as part of this. It, we could also find that we don't get the regional planning commission support without a master plan. So we can finish our municipal plan and serve it up and say, oh, this is what we intend to do over there, by the way, but it's not in the plan. They're not going to approve it. So I would encourage you to invite the regional planning commission to bring some expertise to present to you on growth center requirements and, and new town center requirements. And if you decide those are a good fit, that's going to totally change your work over the next three, four months, because you're going to have to get real focused on filling out an entire chapter that Mike clearly doesn't have the capacity. He, he said we'd have to hire some help. He doesn't have the capacity to do it. So um, I think that's most of what I wanted to say. I've given you a lot to read, uh, and I've given that to ACCD commissioner, and he passed it to his team. I got that email back this morning. So the same thing you've read, they're reading. And I think it's useful to focus the discussion because it'll probably focus their discussion on what they tell Mike we need next. But taking an old application from the original growth center and saying what did and didn't happen in varying degrees without applying it to the expansion, and the statute requires that an expansion of a growth center has to be done as if it were a new application. So for the most part, we don't have to worry about the rest of the growth center. We need to focus an entire detailed application on Country Club Road. And if it's a concurrent application for a new town center for resilience purposes as to our safety zone during the next floods, uh, we have to have that in by September. So that's a lot to throw at you. I hope to be here, be invited if you're going to discuss it. If not tonight, then another time. <laughs> so we look at me on the chair. I'm not sure that I, I'm trying to, I'm an introvert, so it takes me a while to like, piece together my thoughts but if other planning commissioners have reactions or thoughts that you want to share at this time the floor is open well maybe mike could update us on what the what the the city is is hoping uh i had read that uh, the city council was hoping to move forward with the uh, with a new application in the spring. Um, and also, you know, Steve is saying that, you know, it has to be a new town center and it's not clear to me why uh, a growth center expansion that would be part of a larger existing growth center that included all of the things that he was talking about uh, in terms of commerce and housing and um, municipal buildings and all of that stuff, why Country Club Road wouldn't qualify being part of the larger growth center. Uh, because it's not adjacent. Well, I mean, I, I do feel like but Mike it, already it is addressed a, this. It is adjacent to, it is adjacent to the existing growth center. Right, and I feel like Mike gave us a, I, I understood Mike to say that we tried to include it in the growth center or add it to the growth center. That didn't work to continue with that designation, which was going to expire and I forget how many years is going to cost the city a lot of money. There's a lot of new designation programs coming, so why not? Is that, am I remembering right? Yeah, I mean, we have to make a decision once we find all the facts of what it's going to cost and what it's going to require. Um, 
there are a lot of pieces of an application that I can do, but there are other pieces that require consultant helps to be able to do. Um, if I have to do a housing analysis, that's not an, that requires a consultant. If you're going to do um, certain economic analyses, then that's going to require something else. If they want to build out analysis, that's something that would require hiring a consultant to be able to do. So the question, um, when the five-year update was put in, as a part of the five-year update, the application that was initially submitted, there are sections in that that say this, this is what happened in the five-year update, and pertaining to the growth center expansion, here is the discussion. And that went through all the 10 or 12 pieces that were in that application. What we're waiting to find out from uh, ACCD is which of these pieces, how much additional information um, do the analyses need to include the entire growth center, the entire city, or just the application? Because the statute is silent. You, you, you think you just read the statute, you know everything. You don't read the statute, you know everything. You read the statute and find out the statute doesn't talk about this. Same thing that we had when we were writing zoning regulations. You think you've covered all the bases, and then someone comes and says, what about an application in this of, of this type? And you're like, oh. Our, our our rules don't really talk about that. So how do, how do we handle that? That's how they got ACCD got to the issue in the first place was they they were required to do five year updates, and the statute didn't lay out what a five year update was. So they had to make up rules. This is what you have to include in a five year update. So that that's how some of these things come up is you don't have so by letting. Um, the board and their staff who are going to be the people who give the staff recommendation on an application, you've got something in front of you. Tell us what you think about what we gave you. If you're telling us we need all 10, we do all 10. We will meet what they think is necessary in order to meet statutory requirements. They're the ones interpreting it. They're the ones this, this we filled out their application form. They sent me an application form. They said, fill this out. I filled it out, sent it back to them. And so now we're just going to go through and say, all right, tell us, tell us what's missing. Is it two pieces or 10 pieces? Um, because that can impact how much it's going to cost to meet the requirement. And then we can go to council and say, what would you like us to do? I don't have the, the money. I'm not, I, it's council and the public that makes the decision on money. And do you want me to proceed if it costs $5,000? They might say, yes. Do you want me to proceed if it costs $40,000? Well, we that's that's an entirely different question. So those are the things we're going to look at. So do we plan at this time to move forward with a growth center application after we after we get the city plan approved? Yes, that's right now. We expect that's what we're moving towards because that's going to be the most efficient way of moving forward. Um, it is the trigger right now in order for us to build out Country Club Road uh, without asking the taxpayers to pay money is to use a TIF. We would use a TIF to, to build out that infrastructure. We've already done the cost estimations, and I will send you all the links to the Country Club Road plan, which does exist, the big fat plan. Um, but the way these plans work, these master plans, conceptual plans, we had called it a master plan. Uh, member of council didn't like that name, so we changed it to an, an action plan or an actionable plan whatever you want to call it, it's really, it's a conceptual plan. The, the way these processes work, and you've probably been a part of some of these, is they, they're iterative. You're going to go through and say, we've talked to the public, and there was a lot of public input to go into this, to develop this plan of what would the public like to see, what do they don't want to see. And it came down to some, they're kind of blocked out. There's a large area that's on the top of the hill that's for townhouse type, and the lower area was going to be for up to five-story dense housing. And then a section of about 10 acres, 12 acres, was reserved for a community center and recreation. That's what came out of the public process. What we needed, that's what the public wanted. What we needed was to have the city council then go through and say, yes. Does that tell you exactly what's going to happen? No. But it gives you an idea of... <clears throat> 
before we can start planning on how we're going to get there, we've got to know, all right, this is where the public wanted. Are you guys all on board with this? Um, and they didn't vote to adopt. They accepted the plan. So we're going to go back and we're going to have to review to see if ask council to go through and, and adopt this as the conceptual plan moving forward. Because we have to have that taken off the table as you never adopted the plan. Well, we're going to we're going to have that get that step done um, because we're going to have to because we're applying for grants, millions of dollars in grants to fund those next steps. How do we get those next steps? We've done preliminary due diligence on the cost and there are cost estimates in there. Um, and these weren't numbers we made up. This is from VHB with you know, uh, same company that does the work for Newtown Center and in South Burlington and all these ways. This is a professional top of the line organization. They looked through, they came up with what the cost estimates would be. Again, we're looking at you know, back of the envelope. They come up, come up with the number of millions of dollars and the amount of housing. And they said, yes, this, this could work for a TIF. The amount of infrastructure would be about this much. The amount of development would be about this much. It, without, you know, ballpark, it would work. It was for them worth making the recommendation that said this, we recommend that this project move forward because it does make sense. If it didn't make sense, you know, my department would be the first one to go through and say, this isn't going to make sense financially, unless the city is willing to bond to build the infrastructure. This isn't going to work. According to the infrastructure, according to the numbers, they think it's going to work. It's all in this plan and we can lay it out. It's a very detailed plan. As much as much Stephen wants to say, we haven't done anything. It's a very good plan for this step in the process. And it has a lot of the information you need to make that next thing. Does it have the designs of what the buildings are going to? No, because we have to first make that decision of what it is we want to do. Do we want to have five-story buildings in the lower area and townhouses on the second area? Um, and do we want to go through these processes? And we just need to have yes. Now, why this pro process and project hasn't moved forward? Steve won't point out to you the fact that that plan was given to city council on like June 23rd of 2023. Two weeks later, we had a massive flood. My office is destroyed. I lose all my files, all my computers, everything, everything we have is destroyed. And we spend the next year, not only putting my department back together again, but then spending all of our time on grants to rebuild Montpelier. Say so yes, as a priority, Country Club Road did take a second tier to that. We did try to move forward on a number of projects. We had to do the rezoning. We went through and rezoned. Uh, you two were part of that. Uh, Aaron was also part of that. Gabe was part of that. We had to rezone the area in order to be eligible to ask for the growth center application, and we did. We got that all approved. So that step was done. Um, we did go forward and put together the growth center application. Again, we did it at the guidance of the state. The state staff did a staff review. They reviewed it and said it meets it. They recommended it for approval to the board before Steve came in and pointed out that the application process that ACCD was using was not in conformance with state law and they backed down and they they rescinded the approval. So that did take a lot of time to go through and do those processes. This hasn't been a process that is, is stopped. It stopped because Steve pointed those things out. Otherwise, it would have, we would be moving on right now. We have the money in the budget to hire um, White and Burke to do the TIF application. We've stopped that because there's no sense doing the TIF application until we get the growth center. So that has been stopped. We have a contract right now. Um, well, we don't have the contract. We have a contract in hand that we are reviewing to do the due diligence to get the utilities. So again, VHB, the engineering firm, to bring the utilities up to the site to start doing the plans, the actual blueprints. We have an estimate. It's in, it's in the report, which I will send you. Um, so we already have the estimates. Now they're going to go through and do the detailed work. Okay, what is a blueprint? How much pipe? What's it going to cost? What are, what's all this going to do? We've got to put that level of detail in. And again, as we say, it's all iterative. You have to start with the big picture because we need to know big picture, what do you want city council? 
what do we want public first before we can then go through and run the pipe because it doesn't make sense to put in a 10 inch pipe if you only need an eight inch pipe or you wouldn't want to put in a 10 inch pipe and find out you need a 12 because you were going to do more development so we that's why you do these conceptual plans so you can start then doing the next iterative step of okay well now that we're settled on this we're going to do this and each one's going to get more and more detailed as we get closer and closer to the final product and that's the way this process is going to work um and so that's that's a little bit but i will send you those two planning manuals um i can, I can send you the links to those i'll send you the link to the country club road plan um because i think it's important for you guys to have that was a um, it was a big process, and we can always take this up at another meeting if you've got specific questions. Once you have those in hand, then we can have a meeting and talk about specific questions. Mike, I'm curious how uh, responsive the board has been to looking through the application and seeing which parts needed. Uh, the state board? It, it's the staff that's looking. So there's state okay. staff, and then there's a state board. Mm. Well, who, I thought you said the board would get back to you about which parts of the application. Uh, I, I should have said the staff. staff. It's We're working with the staff at this point, and they're working with their, their legal counsel. And as we said, for us, because we had this large application that went in, you've, you know, you've got some information. You know, it, it may be on point one. Good information. We need some backup supplemental information on X. Um, you know, number two looks good as it is. Number three looks good as is. Number four, uh, we would need significant additional information. On but have this. they done that yet? They um, haven't done that. Okay. No. But you're anticipating they will. Yeah, we okay. we asked them to do it, and part of their discussion with us was that they were going to look through our original application. Now, the application in April would be different than the application that went in last April. But we can go through and peel out those pieces if we know the application right. form is going to stay the same. Maybe they go through and say the application form is going to be completely different. We we need to know there's no process at this point. They, there is no application for an amendment. There never was. Uh, that was the 2012 decision. Before I was ever here, this was not written for us. The rules were written way before me, um, which were written that said, if you want to do an amendment, an amendment follows the same rules as a five-year adoption. Well, that turns out to not be correct. But that was the rule they said. That was the rule they followed for 12 years. And that was the rule I followed last year. And then, sorry, Ariane, did you have a question? No, no. You said before, I think it was our last meeting, you said that the growth center originally included that whole property and much more it, it than included it, like, other contracted. it did not include country club road okay but it included many other parts so the other parts when laura was here she was talking about um town uh, town hill road right. and these other places that were now being put into the growth center yeah well I was those areas were already in the growth center right and then um there was opposition at the time again i've I wasn't here in 2009. Yeah. My understanding was there was opposition at the time from VNRC and some of these other environmental groups that said the growth center is too big. It shouldn't be this big. It should be, it should have been smaller. So at the five year reunion, uh, five year, five year, <laughs> the five year update, um, which I was there for, that's uh, 2014. So the, I show up in May and like two weeks after I get here, I get this thing that says I've got to do the five-year update. Okay. So at that time, they said, the staff came out and said, we think it would be in your best interest, Montpelier, to um, avoid, there's going to be a lot of opposition coming in from environmental groups. It okay. might be in your best interest to consolidate and shrink down your growth center to avoid some of the, okay. some of that. We talked to Bill. We made a decision about the value of having that fight at that time. And again, mm -hmm. I've been there like two weeks. So the decision at that time was we would try to make our growth center match our highest density zoning districts. And nobody was here at that time, but we were in the process of updating the zoning at that time. And that was really at the start. So 2014, they gave us a renewal. 
And they said, you got to come back when you get the new maps done and which were in 2016. So two years later, we came back and we had to amend our growth center to make it smaller, to match what were our, okay. like res 6,000. So before res, not all of res nine, but a lot of res nine were in as well as out to the wayside in the Western gateway and uh, some other, there, there's quite a lot of area that was in the growth center. So it was shrunk down to try to target that. But at the time, the benefits of the growth center were much more limited. There weren't these Act 250 exemptions. Mm -hmm. So we weren't seeing that. We were like, you know, what are we fighting for? Yeah. Let's shrink it okay. down. We'll consolidate it. That'll be fine. When we updated our city plan in 2017, we also made that reflect the growth center that's what got us into trouble now yeah. which was that right you can't apply that was steve's point you can't apply to put something into the growth center if it doesn't actually show it in the city plan and that if that one point wasn't there probably everything else would have been fine we probably would have still gone through um but that was the the main point that ACCD said, and at first they had a workaround. They said, well, we'll approve this, but it won't go into effect until you guys adopt your new city plan. That they eventually, as I said, withdrew all of that. That's how we kind of got to where we are, is that it was shrunk down and then we made our city plan match it. And then the benefits of being in the growth center improved. And we were like, oh, it really is to, to the advantage of the housing developers because you can avoid right now it's everyone's always like well it's, which i think we mentioned the last meeting it's like, well it's big projects it's not necessarily big projects it's any project that's it's five units within five miles within five years so if you're a small developer you might buy a property in barry city and one in montpelier and you might be within five miles of each other in which case you you trigger Act 250 on a on a small four unit project, and you're like, ah, oh. you know, and it's that many in five years. So you know, if you do yeah. a couple of projects, doesn't take long. So even small developers who are just adding two units to an existing building get kicked into Act 250, and all the tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars of analyses and studies and fees and and everything else. And so the thought was, if we could get more area of the town into uh, into the that Act 250 exemption, that that's going to help us with our small developers. It's the big projects are still going to need to do Act 250. It's getting these small projects out that was our main our main emphasis for these other areas. For Country Club Road, it was really it was a TIF, and B we had to get out of Act 250. Um, not because we're trying to just get out of Act 250 for whatever reason. It's, it's because the golf course, lower part of the golf course, is prime ag soils. And we know that because we've done our due diligence, and it's in that report. We did the entire Act 250 analysis in that report to go and determine that. That's why we have to get out of Act 250 is because it's in the report. So that's that's why we knew... You can get in, you can get those exemptions from prime ag soils, but you have to apply and go all the way through the process. And it's expensive to apply and it's expensive to go through the process. So as the planning director, I have to go to the city council and the public and say, do we put together, do we spend $250,000 to put together an Act 250 application on the chance that the NRB or land use review board will ultimately give us an exception to the rule and say we can mitigate. Because by rule, you can't mitigate prime ag soils. You have to get an exception. You have to apply for a variance. And that's the, the waiver process means it's going to be a risky process. You can't get that approval up front and then apply. So that's why, from my standpoint, I was like, the best thing we could do is to work ourselves out of the Act 250 process by getting ourselves into the growth center and then managing the process going forward, which may be either we're completely out or we can only do 74 units at a time until we 
you know, until we can build out most of the project or find or just just track it as it goes and see see how it goes. But that was what was going through our mind when we were when we're looking at it. It wasn't willy nilly making making decisions that we want a growth center because that's going to be cool. It was actually directly comes out of exactly what we've been trying to um, try to work through um, to get to keep the project moving forward step by step. Obviously, if we could. If Act 250 wasn't a barrier to the project, the fastest thing to do would be to just move forward, find a developer, and let the developer put together the Act 250 application. They do it all the time. I mean, it's it's not impossible. So can I just ask a question yep. about the, I guess this is something I'm a little bit confused about. So the growth center statute says that you have to like mention or something in the city plan a parcel that you're adding to the growth center i mean that doesn't make a it lot of have to be in i think it has to be identified i don't have identified there's I probably mean, something that says the the low it probably has something in here to the effect of the growth center shall be located the the growth center shall be identified in the city plan or something to that effect that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because things change right and like like the opportunity Every to buy the years. parcel so how would you you don't change your city plan that often yeah, and that was that's that's the difference where things get written by legislators, and yeah, the, then the rest of us kind of show up and go. And and we're going to have this conversation. I'm having it right now with Nick as we're putting together the draft maps for you guys to consider. On okay, we have to have a designations map. We know we've got a designated downtown. We know we have a growth center. I can put those lines on that map right now. The proposed additions to the growth center, assuming that's what we move forward with. What should we do? Should we just add in the res nine neighborhoods in Country Club Road? Should we just add in the complying? Complying in order to comply with um, the the sections, you 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 have to either have or have plans to build out the the all of the required infrastructure for smart growth, so sidewalks and these these things like that. Um, that's not a big lift and a big deal for Country Club Road. We already know that we're going to be putting those in. Those are already going into the plans, so it's already a requirement under zoning that those get built out inside. Um, so in order to, it, we're not exempt from our own zoning our, our own zoning. We're exempt from some things, but not that. If we build out Country Club Road, we have to put in sidewalks. That's just a requirement. Um, so that's not an issue. What we don't have as a requirement in our zoning is that, and this came up with Isabel Circle, um, if you develop a property that's not adjacent to a sidewalk, you have to build the sidewalks inside your project but you don't have to build the sidewalk that connects it to the to the sidewalk that's a quarter mile down the road. Mm -hmm. And that was the issue that some of the conversations I had with the state folks were like, we can approve what's on the ground right now because it's on the ground right now, but we can't approve these other ones because somebody might do another subdivision out past um, uh, the town hill condos out there but there's no connection that connects back down to the intersection of town hill road and main which is where the sidewalk ends um there is some sidewalk that goes up town hill so there's different like we said there's no requirement that was why they were like well really stick to those but for the plan maybe we do put in the plan bigger because of the issue you were just talking about we don't plan to actually apply to the state to put, I'll say Toy Town on the other side of I-89. We don't, it, it can't be in the growth center because there's no sidewalk. But we could put it in the growth center in our plan because if we built the sidewalk, we could then just go and put in an application and add it. So we'll have a conversation about that. What do we want on that map? Because we should probably think about adding more because if we just put in what we think, yeah, and then somebody comes in and says, hey, I'm the next property outside. I'm in rural, 
but I'll run the sewer water and sewer. If you rezone me, I'll put new housing over here. And we'll be like, yeah, that's great. Except I now have to amend my city plan to add that parcel in because of the requirements. So we'll have that conversation when we're doing the land use plan. So the, there's going to be a proposed future land use map. There's going to be a current zoning map. And there's going to be a designations map right now, as far as I can tell. Um, Nick is working on those three maps. We'll build out those storyboards so you guys will have that information to consider. And again, there'll be drafts and we can amend them. And then we'll get public comment and see where we want to go. Go with those. Um, this is this is all really helpful background. I really appreciate all the information that you're sharing here. I just wanted to note that um, in my little bit of research on the growth centers that I think the state of Vermont has six total. Um, uh, they are Williston, Bennington, Colchester, Montpelier, Hartford, and St. Albans City. And there's really only one precedent for an updated boundary. It has happened before. And the only precedent is in Montpelier. It's in Montpelier. Yep. So I just want to note that there's not a ton of precedent around this. So my, it feels right to me to be sort of consulting back with the the, the board and the staff at the state level um, for their recommendations. I had a few questions. Um, getting back to what. Steve thinks that we should be doing in my head. He thinks that we should be coming out with like something like this, like an actual plan. Yeah, I think we're going to. Can I quote you just a little a couple lines from the statute? The growth center has to be shall be located within or shall adjoin a designated downtown village center or new town center. That's a shall for the location. The whole concept here is walkability and then uses. It, the growth center shall support and reinforce any existing designated downtown village center or new town center by accommodating concentrated residential and a mix and scale of commercial, civic, industrial uses that are consistent with the anticipated demand for those uses within a municipality and region. That characterization that the White and Burke report is a plan that we're going to keep building on is not binding in any way. It was not accepted by the council because we don't know whether that's what we want, whether we want townhouses and, and high rises and a tennis club. That community process does need, still needs to happen to envision how we're going to use this property for civic and housing and commercial uses. You, you, and you also, if you want a new town center, you can't have it compete with that other area. So, I mean, this is my question, though, because what I think Mike is saying is that this isn't going to happen unless we have developers who are interested in developing that, and they would only have that interest if it's part of the new growth center. So it is it is consistent and connected. It is connected to the existing um uh, growth center. Sabins, yeah, Sabins Pasture is in the growth center, and this property abuts to Sabins Pasture. So it is connected to the downtown through that. Yeah. We also plan to connect the roadways through. So it's not just you know symbolically connected through some um line that would probably not meet the spirit of the rule um, if we weren't going to be planning to try to connect those roads on through. If it was but just independently sitting out here, it wouldn't be supporting the downtown. But but, but I think, so in my head, I think I texted, I told Ari on this, it's, there's a chicken and egg situation where I think Steve is saying that, no, 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 we need to have this formalized plan before we can have a growth center expansion. But what I'm hearing Mike say is that this plan, we can't even hire someone to come up with a plan like this unless we have the growth center expansion. No, no the, because the the growth center the incentives won't be in place until the growth center expansion exists. Developers don't. There are different there. ways. <laughs> so there are different ways of getting from point A to point B, um, and so one one way is kind of 
maybe Steve's alluding to it, you're you're asking about it, would be for us to go through and really kind of do the design work to the end. I mean, we've already recognized mixed use. That's why we rezoned this to be mixed use. Uh, this isn't zoned strictly for housing. Um, it is zoned to be mixed use. We do hope it will be mixed use, but it is expected to be heavily housing for two reasons. One, we've got a significant housing shortage. We've got a lot of vacancies in our commercial space. We're not, we also don't want to be competing with the downtown. We do want to have neighborhood amenities, neighborhood stores uh, that would benefit you know, a, a small restaurant out there, other other things that are going to either support the recreation side or support the residents that live there, coffee shops. It all going to be, it's all going to be allowed. We, and, and we expect that. And we could go through and design this a lot more and try to find a developer that says, build us what we want. Um, and we, we gave these two options. That's option one to council. Council wanted to do option two. And I, I think it's a, a good way of going, which is we're going to lay out everything in in broad strokes, in concepts, and we're going to go through in some Tim Heaney wants to subdivide. Um, I'm not sure we'll have the council make a decision as to whether or not we subdivide to make this available to private developers. We own it, but we're going to have conditions. Tell us what you're going to put here. We'll approve it and let you go forward. Um, and we're going to do less of the design work and more of the of the review. Let let the private sector you hear yeah. the expression. Let the private sector, you know, we we aren't private sector developers. So let developers come in who've done this in the past and done this in other places and said this has been a successful model for us. We're going to use modular build, or we're going to use stick build, or we're going to hang steel, or we're going to. You know, we're going to need a parking garage or we're going to need this. And then we can go through and say, oh, OK, I can see how that works. Um, you know, is this going to look like South Burlington's new town center or is this going to look like Essex town center? I don't know. Um, we haven't quite got there yet. Both of them have a mix of commercial. Both of them have high densities. So there's a lot. Um yeah, I think one looks more suburban. I mean, if it were me, I'd be thinking South Burlington. I kind of. But I like, I wanted to have a little more urban feel, but it's not my call to make. It's going to be city councils and the public's call to make. But the process wise, um, we could do it that way where we put together the plan and say, this is what we want to see built. Um, or we can go and let the public kind of decide. Yeah, I think it's important to note that the statutes that we, are, that we were all sent are growth center statutes. They are not growth center boundary expansion statutes because they don't exist. Um, and because they don't exist, we, we've been going back to what it was previously. That's what the statute says, that applications to amend a growth center have to be according to the initial application. That's that's the fundamental principle. That's why we have to do this holistically. I think it's important to note that the growth center boundary expansions have only happened once. There's very little precedent for it. It has been successful once, and that was in Montpelier. It was done in error because they worked on the policy that ignored the statute, and now they've revoked that. There's a possibility, I think, the state would come to us and say, we don't have, nothing falls within the statutes for any expansions. That would, I guess, be up to the state to tell us. But if the state thinks otherwise, either staff or board, that there is a pathway through here for another successful expansion in the, in the city of Montpelier, then I, I would hope that we would be able to listen to those recommendations. The time is I, the... I'm a little concerned. Do we have, I just noticed that there are two people on the Zoom. Are they here for the public input session? Because I'm just noticing how much time we've <laughs> spent on this. And I I don't want to get away from the main intent of this meeting, which was a public input session. If so, uh, yeah, so apologies to the people who <laughs> logged in. We're still actually under general business. So um yeah. Um can I close with a, a two? Uh, I, I think we should table this issue for now. 
I, I just I feel like we gotta keep focus on the city plan. Well, let's um, see. And now we're going to table it for now and move on to the, there will be another general business opening at the next meeting. So we're going to just open up with the public input session and see if those two folks on the Zoom are, um, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, we approach this, two, Mike. Two, Maybe you can yeah, help we've me. Got, so we've got two folks on the phone. We're going to be uh, I'll just be starting to kick off the 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 public input session on the the city plan three city plan chapters. Is there something else that you two folks wanted to discuss, or are you here to kind of talk about the or to hear about the city plan? I think they can unmute themselves because everybody else has been able to. Okay. Maybe they're just listening in on a fascinating planning commission. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to. Okay. Um, so I guess I was going to say um, before these folks showed up that everybody else has seen the presentation before and we can just go into the discussion. But I don't know if the if folks have seen it. So I will go very quickly. Okay, great. Through the presentation. Certainly excuse me for Tim's benefit too, because he hasn't seen the presentation. It's there. So we don't all fall asleep. I'm not gonna turn the lights out. I think you guys have all seen this before, but for folks online and hopefully folks on, on your phones can can see, we're gonna go through the, the city plan uh, virtual input presentation. This should only take a couple of minutes. Just to, it'll help to give you an outline of this process. Um, so a little bit of background and history. What is the city plan? Uh, we'll discuss the different chapters um, briefly, and then uh, a little bit of the overall process. And then we could talk a little bit about the rest of tonight um, and how it's going to work. If you're looking for the city plan, where to find it? If you go to our city's main website, go to montpelier-vt.org, and you scroll down, they've got a bunch of these boxes. And sometimes you've got to hit these little carrots over here, these little arrows. And if you find this one, you can click on it. And when you click on it, it'll take you to a page which has a number of symbols like this and a number of points like this. And so every chapter comes in two pieces. So here you'll see there's a historic resources with the bell and the historic resources down below as a PDF. So the historic resources up top, if you were to click on this one, it would take you to the storyboard, which is uh, a, a discussion uh, online uh, with maps and helps to describe why historic resources are important and kind of gives you the, a, a big overview. The click down below the PDF is the implementation plan. And it's much more specific, much more wonky, and really gets into the details of what exactly are very specifically, what are our goals and what exactly are we going to do to accomplish those goals? And we'll go into this in much more detail, but one of the key things to remember for every chapter, we have two pieces. We've got a storyboard and we've got an implementation plan. So a little bit of the background. For 50 years, we've been calling uh, our city plan the Montpelier Master Plan. And for various reasons, uh, our, our a master plan is a term of art in landscape architecture, in engineering, in planning. And what we have is a city plan. It is not a master plan. So for this update, we've changed the name. Uh, it will be the Montpelier City Plan. Um, but just you'll sometimes hear people refer to it as the master plan. That's why it's because for 50 years, it's been called the master plan. Uh, it was most recently updated in 2010 and amended in 2017. But we moved forward with a completely new format and content. And so the, the new format is, this is going to be, oh, uh, well, let me start first with uh, the process in 2016. We started this by uh, developing the goals and strategies for each one of the chapters. And the chapters, 
those eventually went on to become the implementation plans that you see. The web-based plan format, so rather than have a printed document, the PDF, the 300-page plan that most towns have, we decided to move forward with a web-based plan format, and that is those are the chapters. And we decided to go with a separate chapter for each topic. Our current city plan, the Montpelier Master Plan, um, has like four or five chapters, and everything is kind of glommed into big subject areas. Um, that makes it very difficult to work through and find things. We split it back out to the 12 chapters um, because they tend to align easier with statute. We can go through and, and have uh, those conversations. Also, it's easier just to come through with aspirations, goals, and strategies. If you're just talking about housing, what are our housing goals? As opposed to having something called the built environment and trying to come up with something that's going to talk about um, a number of different things. So by breaking it into pieces, it makes it much easier to have a conversation. What are we going to do about housing? What are we going to do about energy? What are we going to do about transportation? What are we going to do about land use? Um, so what is a city plan? Why is it important? Well, first of all, plans are not required under state law. They're not required, but they are needed if you want to adopt or update your zoning. Uh, they are needed if you want to participate in Act 250 and Section 248. Section 248 is the Public Utilities Commission. So if we want to participate in their proceedings, we have to have uh, a city plan that's in place. It's also a necessary requirement for many state and federal grants. But if we want to have a city plan, then we have to meet these four requirements. And those are the it has to meet the state planning goals. It has to be compatible with the regional plan. It has to be compatible with plans, other plans in the region, and it has to contain the 12 elements uh, that are in 24 VSA 4382. So we also talked about having 12 chapters. You see there are 12 element requirements. It's not a one for one, but that's a big reason why there are 12 chapters. So how can they be used? Well, once you have a city plan, um, it has to contain those requirements, but how you use it is really up to the municipality. It could be a long-term guide. Um, you see all of the things here. Um, and it really depends on how we want to use it. Um, ours, for example, really isn't set up for uh, participating in Act 250. We don't get a lot of Act 250 permits. We don't have a lot of policies in here that apply to Act 250. So ours tends to focus more as a long-term guide, decision for making, um, decision-making guide, uh, and action plan. So our goals, and we kind of went over this a little bit earlier, um, the storyboards, those broad views, was to give the public and decision-makers the background on a topic, what are our goals? And generally, what are we going to do to achieve them? So uh, it really was trying to focus in. Uh, its uh, storyboards tend to be mapped. They, they are developed using uh, what's called Esri is the company. Their product, they're a map-based company. And so a lot of this is telling stories through maps and stories and pictures. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, so we're going to explain why is housing important? What are the issues? And what are our goals? And what are we going to try to do to achieve them? Um, the second piece is to, um, get this out of my way, is uh, to have strategies, detailed strategies for an actionable plan. The one criticism we got and the criticism I have of our existing plan is it wasn't very actionable. We wanted to get away from supporting and encouraging things to really get down to what are we going to do to make accessory apartments? What programs or projects or new regulations do we need to pass to get different goals accomplished? So that was the two things we wanted to do, make it an online plan so that way it's more accessible to the public, gives people the information they need to, to have an understanding. And if you wanted the details, we have an actionable plan that would really get in that our committees can then take forward. Our committees can, our housing committee should have this housing plan, our housing implementation plan, and so forth. So they know what our plans are and they can start building that into their eight year plan. Uh, so the overall process uh, 12 chapters, and the planning commission decided we would review three of them at a time over four to six months. It's actually taken 
eight months, nine months. Um, but we do three chapters at a time. Uh, we are currently looking tonight at the third of the three, um, and then we'll have three more coming up. Uh, each will have different input opportunities. Uh, once completed, the Planning Commission will review comments and make revisions. We have a, a list. We have it in an Excel table of the comments we've received, and we go through and make a decision point on each one to go through and decide whether we make a change. So we, we take the public input seriously. So if you have thoughts, we want to hear about it because we will review every comment and make a decision of whether we make the change or don't make the change. I mean, won't guarantee we make changes, but we will guarantee that we will uh, consider the change. And when everything is ready, we'll have a public hearing process. Um, so this is just the public input process. The hearing process will happen once we've gotten through all of these chapters and heard from everybody. So tonight we're looking at natural resources, public safety, and community justice. Public safety and community justice are one chapter, and then economic development. And as we mentioned, three chapters, each one of them has two parts, each has a storyboard, each has implementation strategy. All the pieces are on the website with the exception of one, economic development, which we talked about last time had been taken down that day. And uh, I communicated with SE group and they were gonna be getting it back up and they, and they didn't. And I've gotta go and find out, I think she might be out. So I think that might be why we haven't been able to get that one put back up, but they had taken it down to make updates and it hasn't been put back up. So the other pieces are there, but that one is not. Um, so each each storyboard follows the same, a similar um, organization and we'll go through that. And each implementation plan starts with aspirations, then has goals and then has strategies. and. Um, This is what each one looks like. So you've got transportation plan right here. This is what a storyboard looks like. Uh, and you'd be able to scroll through reading and getting information. And over here's aspirations, goals on the right-hand side and the different strategies. Each strategy has a box and um, priorities, costs, who's responsible and a little description. And so the rest of tonight, I'll leave the PowerPoint and bring, bring up the storyboards and strategies. We can walk through them. It really is up to you. Uh, we've kind of used a lot of time, so we're not going to go through all of the storyboards, but I can pick which one we want to go through or which ones we want to go through, and we can talk about them and take input. But if you have any questions or want to email anything, you can get in touch with me, Mike Miller. So it's mmiller at montpelier-vt.org, and I can go through and answer those and so those questions and any input I will bring back to the planning commission and they, as I said, they will consider it. I'll put it in the, in what we call the matrix and we will go through each one of the comments. And I will stop sharing. Okay, great. Please. Away. Oh, stop sharing. There we go. So, um, is there a preference from commission or from the public? I don't know if uh, Joanne or the other person on the phone or intra have a specific area of concern or questions or comments. I want to make sure we give you opportunities to make sure I've got host tools unmute themselves. All right. You sh well, yes, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, so there shouldn't be anything that blocks those. Maybe we just give it just a minute or two and see if anyone. I said otherwise I can. Okay. Seems like there are not comments, but I just wanted to make sure that we covered that. I mean, 
I don't think we need to cover the storyboards if there's no comments, but yeah, I don't. I have comments, but I don't need to see the storyboard. Okay. You can go ahead. Uh, on public safety, um, I've mentioned before to most of you, but Tim wasn't on the uh, commission then about regional dispatch. We spent many years, I think since 2016 or so, uh, convening a regional public safety authority to share resources and dispatch and it faltered on governance. Uh, and there is a state level task force wrestling with this issue and a report that won't be out till January. Um, but no matter how the state report comes out, there's going to be a need for regional governance. The guidance has been coming from the federal government, the Computer and Information Security Administration. Uh, SISA has put out information about the need for governance of communications for public safety. And we have failed miserably, both at the state level and at the regional level and at the municipal level, because we entered into a agreement with Capital Fire Mutual Aid 20, 30 years ago, uh, which formed a governing body made up of our fire chief and police chief and city manager, and the same for the Capital Fire Mutual Aid system, which is basically a bunch of firemen who share responses to each other's fires. Um, but that governing body has never met once in 20 some odd years. There's no minutes, no agendas, no, there's no evidence that that body has ever met. And we've had real problems with dispatch. Uh, antennas going down because, and nobody noticing for weeks on end until somebody from the phone company points out that, you know, you're, that transmitter's not up because the line went down or, a dispatcher not connecting the record of a person who's in psychological distress and at the second response, putting two rifle rounds in him and killing him. I, I think you you did share this, and I assume that Mike put this in the matrix of public comments. I'm also trying to remember, was there a specific like thing that you wanted to put in the city plan about dispatch or? Yeah, I think that the city needs to uh, support a regional model of dispatch without without being committed to owning it and having an unregulated monopoly on the dispatch service. And it has to do with who owns the radio system and how who among the served towns might decide to hire a different operator, um, which is currently not possible because the city generates four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars in revenue off of this. And they don't want. Uh, in any case, I think Kim Cheney, the former chair of the region of the Public Safety Authority, I just called him, but he's not able to with he's not able to navigate. He's 80 something years old. He's not able to navigate a Zoom link in this rush environment to get into your meeting. I, I mean, theoretically, you could email him the agenda and he could click on the link, but. Um, okay, well, I think we could include in the matrix, you know, part of your recommendation is maybe following up with Kim Cheney or about now, a recommendation. Yeah, but, yeah, um, anyone anyone can send us comments. If Kim yeah. just wants to send oh, me right. written comments, he's yeah. welcome to send me yeah. written comments. Well, too. Well, a couple so. other public safety dimensions would be the safety of the bike path, because that's uh, that's where you do have jurisdiction of how and and it will necessitate that you address the fact that every place that the unhoused population has congregated the city has repeatedly taken it away it was the you know the gazebo down by the other bike path bridge down behind dmv and it was removed it was put on the empty lot on main street and it was removed. And then the bus shelter 
uh, right in front of Shaw's, and it was removed. This city has a, a real habit of removing any place that the unhoused people gal could be. And so would your recommendation be like a day center or what would your recommendation be? No, I don't think you can categorize or lump all the unhoused people together. One, people should be housed, but two, you need a diversity of places where you can get out of the rain. If if we're assume we're always going to have some number of unhoused people for whatever reasons, you need, I mean that I've got photos, they've started chaining off the pavilion porch. Folks were but just before the flood, people were living under that porch and the tents got washed out into the, and people were sleeping up on the porch. So, so a, a diversity of sheltered outdoor yes. places. Okay. Yes. Is your uh, recommendation. And, okay. and another that has to do with public safety is the fact that we, despite repeated advice from SISA at the federal level, that we should get off of the .org domain because we do, we, we're forfeiting by staying at Montpelier-vt.org, we're leaving ourselves exposed to computer attacks, which could totally disable all our IT systems. And the protection that's available with a .gov address through layers of uh, security and filtering and expertise warrants moving off of this .org. We are not a .org, we are a .gov. And we should just uh, get with the program and quit masquerading as a .org. It was a bad decision back then, and it needs to be corrected. And it was raised with city council, but it would have more weight if it were in the plan. That we're extremely vulnerable by not availing ourselves of the extra added protection that's available by being a .gov address. Okay. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, and if you have other comments, you're welcome to email them to Mike about those three chapters. I just want to cover a few more, you know, kind of plan out the next meetings and consider the minutes. And um, well, I didn't get a copy of the one of the chapters you're discussing tonight because of computer glitches. So, it's, oh, the economic development. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so I think you should schedule that for a future one meeting. Well, I mean, we anytime these chapters are up, when we get to the next three, we've had people come in earlier in these three to talk about arts and culture okay. because they yeah. weren't here. So, so I mean, right. So when we do the next three chapters, it's okay. You know, we try to focus on those three chapters, but if there's anything specific, yes. Um, Great. I don't expect that to be down. I mean, it may not be back up till next week because I don't know. If our consultant is back before Thanksgiving or or not because this, I haven't I haven't heard back from her. Okay. So. Yeah. Stone environmental? No. Um so thanks, Mike, for um sending us the draft resilience chapter text. I think that was on our email. Um and there's copies here, I think, yep. right, that you provided. Can I ask a quick question to Mike? Um Looks like we can't use the Google Drive approach to doing edits on that anymore. Is that correct? And if correct. that's the case, uh, I'm trying to trying to remember what life was like before COVID. Um, <laughs> I just remember I remember the old days of just sitting around the table and just kind of going line by line and making edits as a group. But um, I guess the the long short of it is I've I've been working on some proposed red line edits um, to the storyboard, and I'm just wondering what's the best way to uh, get that to the group going forward if we can't use the Google Drive anymore? So in the past, we would, as Aaron points out, we would sit around and write by committee. And it was long and slow and laborious and painful. And eventually what happened was um, one, usually Kirby, would end up just taking the lead and going through and doing um, basically a, a red line, in some cases, wholesale rewriting things, some cases um, just going through. The framework kind of has to stay there, um, which Aaron knows, the introduction, the plan context. Um, so one option is everybody takes this home, chews on it, and then brings back comments, and we kind of talk through it. Um, they can send it all back to me, and I can compile them, or we can have 
one person if if you know, like we said in the past it was Kirby who would just kind of take it and do do once through so it had my thoughts and then his wordsmithing and if Aaron wants to go and jump in and do the wordsmithing and um the idea is that in this case this was kind of put together with a, a couple of framework pieces one of which was uh, emergency management breaks into four pieces. So I broke this chapter into four pieces. It's resilience, but it's also emergency management, kind of a, a, a merging of those two topics. Uh, so it really kind of breaks into response, recovery, mitigation, and preparedness, which is um, the the way the federal emergency process works. Um, so we're, we look at each piece discreetly, the response being what is actually happening in the event just before we know it's going to flood. We've got a prediction of flood. What are we doing just before and during that flood event? Say, Mike. So, yes. Um, could you could you just tell us what? I mean, I started going through it. I didn't get through the whole the whole uh, all the goals and aspirations and stuff, but I read some of the text. Can you just talk about the process that your team went through to get here? I know there's kind of an unofficial community that exists out there you reference them who provided the goals and aspirations and who else has looked at it, i guess besides the city staff so so far i've i put together the framework i put together all the goals and strategies i used the existing plans i don't just make these up out of out of thin air there there is a plan right out there right now called maple uh, which the resilience and recovery commission put together and I looked through all of the things that we are doing um, to kind of put these things into different boxes based on based on the those four requirements. So um, I put it together. I've sent it to John Copans. He is reviewing it with his staff. Uh, they have not set up in a time we talked about setting up a time to have me meet with them. But for now he's working with his commission to go through and look at what we have, but he's only looking at the implementation plan. Um, he's not looking at the storyboard. So I'm kind of, as long as that is framed with these four steps, as long as we keep with these four groupings, you guys can work out the storyboard and it should all fit together. Um, we'll have to talk about the like the fourth bullet, the implementation summary, obviously if they change their the implementation summary in some significant way, we would have to go through and amend that summary. But uh, the other pieces are laid out here. So that's, okay. who's re that's who's reviewed it. So in the Thank past, you. yeah, in the past other chapters were always done by the committees that were responsible for them. So housing did the housing chapter, transportation did the transportation chapter, energy did the energy chapter. In this case, resilience, uh, we've sent it to them for updates. Okay. I, guess I would probably favor like a time limited, like we have it all have a chance to look at it and then come to a meeting and give our edits or, or I don't know whether it's better to send our edits to Mike, but then if they're conflicting edits, I know. <laughs> that's where we get into trouble. Um, so you're, we're really not allowed to use the Google Drive. Nope, that was that was allowed. For, there were there were a lot of COVID, COVID waivers that were given to get through stuff, but then afterwards the Secretary of State came through and said that having everybody work on the same document online is the same as meeting in person. So it is a meeting without an agenda and minutes and all the pieces. So. Is there anybody who would feel comfortable taking a first stab at it? Because Kirby's approach was actually really helpful. He kind of give us something that was, you know, there were some edits too, and then we could, it was just a little bit easier to kind of work through the whole thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's not I'm, my area, but. I was going to say, I'm, I'm about halfway through the document already, and it's I've got some pretty heavy duty redlining in it. Um, so I'm happy to do that and get that redline draft to everybody if, if they're agreeable with that. Um, consistent with sort of past practices. Um, I usually do my edits. I think Mike always has a very good sense of how to structure the storyboards. To And so I try not to mess with any of the concepts, but just sort of move the language around a little bit to tighten it up. Um, so that's usually my, my goal. Um, so if people are comfortable with me doing that, I can get that done and get a, get a new draft everybody um, 
I'll probably I'll probably send it out like over the weekend after Thanksgiving because nobody's going to be doing any of this work for the next few days anyway. I don't think so. Um, I think that'd be great. Yeah, okay. If you send it to me, I can send it to everybody, and that avoids issues. And then you guys would have it in advance, just to not to talk amongst yourself with, but to to be able to review those changes. So when we meet, we can kind of be all this all up to speed on it. And right. for the new for the new folks online and and here writing these things is not my strongest skill uh i i've got a lot of skills uh writing creative writing is not one of them so i've always said i no pride so if you guys see edits that you're like let's go and reword this uh you're not gonna you're not gonna be hurting my feelings uh go go forth and go like forth that? and beat it up done the hard part. So I know. It, it is the hard part. Yeah. To create something yeah. from nothing. So the fact that something exists makes it Infinitely easier yeah. for us to then tweak it. I always find responding to things is always easier than giving people a blank sheet of paper and trying to write it. So, um, but again, yeah. uh, and Kirby knew this, and Aaron knows this. You know, if the you know if there's a wholesale redlining because I'm not being clear, my wife will tell you. <laughs> I don't know where you're trying to go with this, but you're not yeah. doing it. so. Clear it up. It's put it it makes per like it. I'm sure it makes perfectly good sense in my head, which it does. Okay. I've, been, I've been on the commission long enough. I, I know exactly what you're saying in every juncture. So I just, <laughs> wow, I just, try, I just, try, to, I just try to massage okay. it a little bit. That's all. Yeah, just make it so okay. everybody else gets it. I, you know, it <laughs> makes sense in my head. So. I have a question. I have also gone through it, and I just like did my usual adding comments on the side. So am I not allowed to send that to Aaron? No, that can... would be like meeting i can uh, yeah well, yeah just send me your send me your comments and i'll incorporate them into my red lines and we'll have a comprehensive what document. is that yeah where's the line of like coordinating too much pages, outside of it's, editing. i think it's the yeah it's the open open if you don't have a quorum then i think you're okay there's yeah. only oh, a couple so of right. you've got other things yeah, you've got small groups of two or three people yeah if on. everybody okay. put stuff together and sent them to aaron and he compiled them then Okay. That's not an issue. It's, that sounds it's great. When we have an open, a, a share doc, and at some point, legislature will have to get around to addressing the 21st century because everything is now in shared docs. Yeah, you know, and that's just how everything works nowadays. But okay, great. So everyone okay. will send who has comments, maybe can send them to Aaron by this weekend. Yeah, I was gonna say, how about we do this? Um, I'm just gonna work on my red lines alone, and then if, if everybody can get me everything by the end of the weekend, that'd be helpful, and so I can get hopefully a draft out okay. uh, on mon Monday or Tuesday next week. So. Okay, right. and I think we are only probably gonna have one meeting in December. I'm assuming because I yeah. think the entirely up to you guys. Uh, I don't have my calendars in I front of me to know if the, the second fourth... one is landing on the 23rd or something. Yeah, sir. I feel like the fourth one is the 23rd, which seemed unlikely, but maybe I don't have yeah, my calendar. It's the 23rd, the 9th and 23rd. Yeah, I'm not available that week. Yeah, that's, okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, ex expectation is we're meeting on the 9th. Okay. Uh, we can talk about it, won't be a public input okay. session. It'll be yeah. a It'll be a working session. So, we can review the comments that we've received. Maybe we can get through a quick chunk because we don't have a lot of remember in, in the first three that we did we had housing and we had like 89 comments on housing yeah. and the second three we did we had about 80 comments on energy this time we'll have you know 10 or 12 okay. comments and so we should send we out the, those. the matrix again because i assume tim didn't get it the matrix I will, of yeah i will send out okay, i'll send great. out the matrix with, okay. the, with the updated comments for this these three chapters and okay, then great. we'll review the resilience. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad we're going to have a working session. Excited. Yeah. Um, so if anyone wants to quickly move approval of the November 12th minutes, if you yeah. second to review them. And I have two changes. I am 99% sure Aaron was not here for the 12th. Oh yeah, neither was Brian Mills. <laughs> and Brian Mills yep. wasn't on the commission. So um, those two huh. were not here. I move to accept the minutes with those edits. 
Okay, do we have a second? Well, I think Steve spoke at the general business too. There's there's something about Laura La Rosa who's here. Were you were you here in the no, last? No, you weren't here. Last. You were here. Oh, before. it was Tim Heaney. Okay, never mind. Yeah. never mind. Yeah, it was Tim Heaney and. In... Uh, second approval with the changes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, Aye. Great. I would accept a motion to adjourn. <laughs> you have said motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Yes. You too. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. 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 Thanks.